The 21st century is an age characterized by mass media and the impact it has upon an increasingly globalized world. With greater frequency and variety than ever before, creative directors have taken to the vast ocean of history for inspiration, casting their nets and fishing for the stories, events, and people to bring through life in their mediums. But in presenting these narratives, those creators constantly grapple with the question of how to portray the past, and more importantly for this panel, who to include and who to exclude from their works. In reviewing these works of popular media, discussions on the inclusion or exclusion of persons of non-white race are continually linked back to the idea of historical accuracy, an idea that is, in and of itself, susceptible to misconstruction and hence capable of being used to marginalize the roles of BIPOC people throughout history. Greetings and welcome to the Ask Historians Digital Conference session, Racism is so universal it has become normal race, representation, and accuracy in works of popular media. My name is Ivan, though you may know me from my writings on the Ask Historians Reddit as Star Wars Nerd 222. I will be chairing this panel, during which our speakers and myself will explore the way BIPOC people have been portrayed in various works of media, as well as discussing the accuracy of such portrayals or lack thereof. Before we begin this panel, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in the video description below. Introducing our speakers for this session then. Our first speaker today is Claudia Bonillo Fernandez. She is a current PhD student at the University of Zaragoza and a researcher at Kyoto University. Her research explores the transmission and depiction of the Sengoku period in Japanese popular culture with a special focus on video games. This specialization is reflected in the paper she will be presenting titled At the Mercy of the Tide, the history of the Chosokabe clan according to Nobunaga's ambition Sphere of Influence, Koei, 2013. Onwards to you, Claudia. On 12 December 2013, the 13th installment of the Nobunaga no Yabo Saga was released in Japan for PC and PlayStation 4 to critical and commercial acclaim. Two years later, it would be released with similar success in the rest of the world under the name Nobunaga's Ambition, Sphere of Influence. According to its producer, Ogasawara Kenichi, the development of the video game was based on three main pillars. The realism of the setting, the dynamism of the gameplay, and the drama of the characters expressed through the historical events. In this presentation, we will focus on the analysis of the third point, the characterization of the historical figures, specifically those related to the Chosokabe, a small clan established on the southern island of Shikoku. The video game is set in the Sengoku period, also known as the Warring States period, which is considered to span part of the Muromachi and Asuchi Momoyama periods, beginning with the Onin War and ending with the rise to power of General Tokugawa Ieyasu after his victory of the Battle of Sekihara for the unification of the nation in uh, 1600. The Sengoku period is characterized by an almost total absence of central asset power, with power thus remaining in the hands of the feudal laws lords or daimyo, leaders of microstates called kuni, each with different objectives, common among which was the protection and expansion of the territory. The story of the Chosokabe clan begins in 11194, the princes and the ogre. It tells of the clan's origins in Oko Castle in Tosa, the base of the Chosokabe clan, which eventually lost all of its territory and disappeared. Fortunately, the game says, it was revived through the efforts of its 20th leader, Kunichika. Historically, the origin of the Chosokabe family is uncertain. Specifically, the Chosokabe clan prospered from the Hosokawa clan, who held the rank of Shugo, for whom they acted as a reward from Oko Castle, as the video game indicates. The situation changed during the Onin War. 
In 158, an alliance of the Motoyama, Yamada, Kira, and Ohira clans attacked Oko Castle, forcing Choso Kabe Kanetsu to, com to commit seppuku. During the fighting, Kanetsugu's six-year-old son, Chiyomaru, called Kunichika as an adult, fled to seek refuge with his powerful ally, uh, the Ichiyo clan in Hata country, keeping the family line alive. As the 20th leader of the Chosokabe clan, Kunichika managed to accumulate significant political, economic, and military power, becoming one of the most important daimyo of the early Sengoku period. The event then moves forward to 1560, when Chosokabe Motochika, Kunichika's son and the protagonist of the rest of the events, inherited the position of clan leader. He describes how, because of his calm character, the other children called him Young Princess. However, when he fought bravely in an unequal fight during his baptisms of fire, he became known as Young Demon. The two nicknames are translation of Himewako and Oniwako, nicknames for which there is no historical proof, but they are, were used and which seem to have originated from Agunki. As for his first battle, it refers to a decisive engagement at Tonomoto during the Battle of Nagahama in 1560, in which the Chosokabe and Motoyama class clashed. In the next event, Farmer Samurai, the game tells of a system devised by Kunichika. Hereby, soldiers participated in farming in peacetime, but kept their weapons and armor close by in case they were called to arms, allowing an army to be mobilized more easily and providing a sense of unity to the clan. This is a description of the Ichiryo Gusoku, whose origin is popularly attributed to Kunichika. Also, their achievements are linked to Motochika, who have a monument erected in their honor in the city of Kochi. Also, their bravery is praised in the Ganki title Tosa Monogatari. Recent studies consider that they were only a group of low-ranking samurai common to all clans and not a system exclusive to Chosokabe clan, as popular culture uh, has spread. Nevertheless, it is true that in the Tosa region, there were considerably more such traps compared to the rest of the domains. The 196th event, the exile of Kanesada Ichiyo, tells of how Kanesada was driven out of his territory in, in 1574 due to the trickery and military might of the Chosokabe clan and fled to Bungo, the domain of his father-in-law Otomo Sori. At the end of the event, Motochika expresses his concern that his father-in-law's army will lend troops to Kanesada for the Chosokabe to prove their worth. This phrase is most likely a reference to the Battle of Watarigawa, also known as the Battle of Simantoawa, which took place in 1575 between the Chosokabe and Ichiyo clans. Grand ambition is set after the aforementioned battle. At the event, Motochika is said to have defeated Ichiyo Kanesada in a landslide, bringing all of Tosa under his control. Chikayasu congratulates his brother of his success and comments that his people have given him a new nickname, the father of Tosa, although no reference has been found to confirm that he was given this nickname, which is not even common in popular culture. Motochika speaks of his intention to conquer Shikoku, for which he will have to conquer Hakuchi Kase. As a preliminary step, however, he wants Chikayasu to go to the other clan to persuade them to accept his plan to control Shikoku. The next event, Island Squatting Bat, recounts the meeting between Chikayasu and Nobunaga, leader of the Oda clan. Chikayasu asks for, per for permission for the Chosokabe clan to conquer Shikoku as a vassal of the Oda clan. Nobunaga is not convinced that Motochika is powerful enough to achieve this, and believes that Motochika is like a bat squatting on his island with no birds to challenge him. A quote inspired by the phrase, Motochika wa mujinto no komorichi, in the Tosa Monogatari. It should be noted that Motochika did indeed propose to Nobunaga to become his vassal, but it is not proven that Chikayasu was sent as a messenger. As the culmination of a series of related events, it is common for this video game to feature Einstein exposing counterfactual history. This is the case with the 200th event, the unification of Shikoku, which tells of how Motochika has succeeded in unifying Shikoku and is preparing to conquer the rest of the nation. Indeed, by 1585, Motochika had succeeded in bringing virtually the entire island of Shikoku under his control, taking Awa at the Battle of Nakatomiawa in 1582 and Sanuki in 1584. However, in 1585, the regent Toyotomi Hideyoshi initiated the invasion of Shikoku as part of his plan to unify the nation, overwhelmingly defeating the Chosokabe army and forcing its surrender, allowing Motochika to retain only the Tosa region.
In this presentation, we have found that the video game offers an updated audiovisual version of the Ganki, chronicles that have shaped the view of the Sengoku period generals since the Edo period. Drawing on these chronicles makes it possible to stick to the timeline of historical events. In addition, it favors the introduction of anecdotes that add a novelistic touch that enlivens the historical narrative. On the other hand, it is worth noting Koei's remarkable contribution to the narrative aspect through the introduction of numerous dialogues that make the action progress without constantly resorting to a narrator, giving rise to a fluid history that humanizes the historical figures involved. On the other hand, the, the, the idealization of certain events, as well as the simplification of the villains, is an obstacle to giving a more balanced view of the clan's history. Finally, there is a tendency to avoid giving a personal view on controversial issues, such as the Chosokabe's involvement in the invasion of Korea, although this is understable given that the video game is a commercial product. All in all, we can conclude that the historical events of Nobunaga's ambition and sphere of influence offer the player an excellent insight into the Chosokabe clan and their involvement in the world in the state's era establishing a strong starting point for anyone wishing to delve deeper into the history of, he, of this tenacious clan of Tosa warriors. Thank you for that, Claudia. Our second speaker is Stefan Aguirre Kiroga. He is a historian based in Sweden whose research focuses on the presence and experiences of marginalized groups as combatants in 19th and 20th century military history. As a part of that topic, his research also explores how historical memory has been used to exclude people of color from popular representations of history. This focus is reflected in the paper he'll be presenting titled Counting Black Faces, the Marginalization of Black British Soldiers in Response to 1917. Over to you, Stefan. In making the film 1917, director Sam Mendes consciously set out to showcase the multiracial aspects of the First World War. Although the film centers around two white British antagonists on the Western Front, Mendes stated that he, quote, wanted to reflect and acknowledge that it wasn't just a war fought by white men, end quote. The film is populated by soldiers of color who would have historically been present on the Western Front. In the rear lines and in the trenches, we see black British soldiers amongst otherwise all white British regiments. The film's protagonist encounters a, a Sikh soldier who shares the same amount of screen time and dialogue as the white characters in the scene. Through these inclusions, the film continued the trend of highlighting the First World War's multiracial and multicultural dimensions that had begun in the years leading up to the First World War centenary in 2014. From the Indian officers present in Steven Spielberg's War Horse to the first ever depictions of black soldiers from the British West Indies in the BBC war dramas, The Crimson Field and The Passing Bells, the medium of film and television appeared to have finally caught up with historical scholarship that accurately described the Western Front as the most multiracial place on earth during those fateful four years. 1917 took it a step further by acknowledging an additional truth present in contemporary scholarship that scholars such as David Killingray, Ray Costello, and Jacqueline Jenkinson have helped to establish. The presence of domiciled black British soldiers serving alongside white British soldiers on the Western Front. These were men of African ancestry born in London, Bristol, and Glasgow, men whose families had in some cases lived in Great Britain for generations, but whose participation in the conflict had been forgotten or erased. Now, their participation was slowly beginning to be weaved into popular representations of the war from which they had been excluded from for over 100 years. The inclusion of soldiers in 1917 was not welcomed by everyone. After the release of the film, a racist backlash ensued as individuals online began to question the presence of soldiers of color, a presence that they deemed to be historically inaccurate and, quote, forced, unquote, into the film because of a supposed desire to be politically correct. Time and time again, across mes message boards and social media feeds, the very notion of men of Asian or African descent serving alongside white British soldiers was ridiculed 
with many claiming it was an impossibility or a misrepresentation of history. These views gained mainstream notoriety when British actor Lawrence Fox expressed several bigoted views on a podcast about the inclusion of, a, of the Sikh soldier in the film, claiming that the, quote, oddness in casting, unquote, had broken his immersion. Although Fox racist comments were rightfully condemned in the media, Fox appeared as an aberration. Widespread argu arguments marginalizing Black British soldiers online were not acknowledged. The numbers of soldiers of color, the majority of them of African descent seen in the film are less than 10 individuals. They often appear only for a brief moment, populating the background that the protagonists move through. In a film with hundreds upon hundreds of extras, they make up a very small part. Yet their visibility in the film was enough to cause a crisis among those who proclaimed to be safeguarding historical accuracy. In a representative example, one individual on the r slash history subreddit on Reddit claimed that there were too many Black British soldiers in the film, questioning whether or not 1917 was, quote, playing fast and loose with historical accuracy for the sake of inclusivity by, quote, showing unrealistically diverse British units, unquote. The racial balance in the film, these individuals argue, is exaggerated and holds no basis in reality. There could not be that many Black British soldiers serving alongside white soldiers because there simply were not that many Black British men in Great Britain in the early 20th century to begin with, the argument concludes. The central exclusionary argument surrounding the marginalization of Black British soldiers in response to 1917 is therefore a numerical one. There is a determined effort to use numbers and statistics in order to deny space for Black British representation. This is a common strategy in the context of popular historical depictions of people of color in spaces that are believed to have been exclusively white. This racist belief is something I have termed as the white mystic space of history, a space in which people of color are excluded or marginalized from in order to ensure a continuity of white hegemonic history, the representation of which subsequently becomes a model of authenticity. In order to safeguard this white mystic space, commenters set out to prove the negligibility of the black presence on the Western Front. They do so by occasionally using real estimates made by scholars of the black population in Great Britain during this time period, but decontextualizing them from scholarly interpretations and treating the numbers as objective facts. They then frame these estimates in a way that highlights the presence of Black British men in uniform as a trivial matter. This misuse of historical research is in complete opposition to what these estimates were originally made for. Under the disguise of historical accuracy, these arguments put forward the notion that the historical numerical presence of a certain race determines if they deserve to be represented or not. While the presence of white men remain unquestioned, their whiteness becoming the key to their legitimacy, the presence of black men has to be justified. 1917 points towards a more inclusive historical memory of the First World War. While the film is not groundbreaking in featuring white British protagonists, it is who populates the landscape that challenges basic assumptions anchored in decades of whitewashed popular depictions of the war. The reaction to the film and the need to marginalize soldiers of color exemplifies how historical representations can be a contested space over historical memory. For these individuals, the only First World War they will accept is one that depicts a white man's war. Uh, thank you for that, Stefan. And of course, thank you to both our speakers today for their interesting and engaging papers on the topic at hand. And we're now going to be moving into a discussion phase where we discuss key themes brought up in both papers and try to understand where the current 
popular media landscape is in terms of representing race, as well as the whole construct and idea of historical accuracy within works of popular media. Firstly, both of your papers have explored the idea of historical accuracy in the respective works of popular media that they focused on. This construct, this term of being true to the past is often scrutinized and or criticized by members of the public, sometimes with the argument that there is too much creative license being employed in the work and therefore it detracts from the historical accuracy, or conversely, that sacrificing historical accuracy within the work is acceptable to increase its appeal to a larger public. So with regard to this balance, this task of balancing between historical accuracy and the appeal to an audience, what approach do you think popular media producers these days need to adopt? Chris Kemshaw, the video game scholar, speaks specifically of something he calls authenticity light. Authenticity light is essentially the authenticity of, of visual markers, of statics, of essentially the very notion of, of the feeling of history, that this feels right when I watch something that has to do with history, when I play a video game, when I read a novel, it's the little details, the, uh, the, the, way, they, the way they might talk, the way they might dress, the, the uniforms, the weapons, even how they might dress their horses. These are all things that make up authenticity light, and that's usually what um, what people expect um, from, from a historical product. Something that isn't fully historically accurate. I mean, we wouldn't want the boring parts. We want something entertaining when we watch a film. We want something that engages us, but without going deeply into something that we don't understand or we don't, can't really grasp. There are obviously problems with this because authenticity light is based on what has come before, what is, has been established in the past, not only in, in, in historical depictions, uh, but also in historical myths, in, in all sorts of matters regarding historical memory, such as, the, as in the case of the Black participation in the First World War, because that's showing the, the, the reality of, of the multiracial First World War is going to cause some immediate response because it's such a revolutionary depiction to do today. But had you been thumbing through the, the War Illustrated News of London in, in the 1910s, you would have been seeing countless of photographs and references to soldiers from all over the world, whether from into China or from Senegal or from uh, India. Um, and that's and that's what we call uh, what I call the white music space because that in itself becomes a, a different model of authenticity that lives next to authenticity light in which race becomes sort of the, the focus of authenticity. So Europe, for example, is seen as, as white. It is seen as uh, something that is a lily white. There, there, is no, there are no person of color in, in, in the past until the 1960s, more or less. Essentially, is that's that's the argument that they're making, including people of color in where they were historically, uh, therefore causes reactions that that can in some cases become downright hateful, as as I've already proven and shown. Um, but going back to what 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 producers can do today, uh, that's a very important question. Um, I would say that obviously authenticity light, that's something that's going to continue. It's not gonna, going to vanish anytime soon. It's, uh, it's so intricate to the very productions of historical representations and it always has been. Um, but there, there is a desire, for example, in, in, to have a more increased racial representation in, in popular films, for example, or popular video games that takes place in, in, in history in the past. Um, However, there is, a, there is a wish, there's a desire to, but there is also not um, a lot of right ways of doing it yet for these people because they, they, have, um, they don't have the right people behind the scenes, for example, to, to work it. I mean, there is, there is a lack of inclusion 
a lack of diversity in um, in production in the so you, you know in the production companies whether it's uh, a video game production company or or screenwriters or directors who can understand when and where to include people of color but also how to do it correctly so they don't become just uh, a tokenized inclusion uh, or that it's done with that in a way that's not only historically accurate but also not uh, insulting or revert, reverting to um, damaging tropes. Um, <laughs> while the, the desire is there, there's a wish to, to have more inclusion. Um, there, there's still a, a lot of way to go, which is, has more to do with the state of the industry rather than uh, the content itself at, at the moment. Hmm, I don't think it is. I'm, I'm going to focus most on the producer side. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm going to connect with the reasoning of uh, Stefan, but I think here are two uh, uh, problems. Uh, you can be accurate to the historical reality or the historical reality that uh, academics have researched, or you can be uh, you can be faithful to the social imaginary, to uh, what people believe history is. Uh, in the case of uh, Stefan, uh, well, uh, there are no black persons in the First uh, World War. That is what uh, people think, but academic research have uh, proven the contrary. In case, uh, in case of Japanese history, uh, that fiction uh, comes from the 18th century of the Edo period. So I think that uh, for video games or cinema or any media culture that wants to be historical accurate, I think it, uh, all of these products should sacrifice historical accuracy if that makes better the product, if that makes uh, the video game, the gameplay of the video game uh, more enjoyable, if it makes the, um, the movie easier to watch, if it is bigger, to uh, make the product better for the public, I think it should uh, sacrifice historical accuracy. It is not a research paper. Research papers uh, are not very entertaining to read most of the time if you are not an expert. But I think it should not sacrifice historical accuracy because of the sake of what people have been thinking until now. If they don't include, uh, in the case of black persons, is more uh, is more difficult this type of example because I don't think the inclusion of not of black people affects the enjoyment of the film because a black person appears, it does not make the film less enjoyable. So it should not be a problem to include it. In the case of video games with the gameplay is a bit more uh, difficult, but I think, uh, for example, if you want to uh, don't make uh, the war accurate because war was a very static thing and in gameplay that is a bad thing, you uh, should make uh, war more dynamic. But uh, you should not uh, reproduce the stereotypes of the characters, not because it is more enjoyable doing it like that, but because people always have thought that it was like that. You don't have to perpetuate those stereotypes. That aff doesn't affect uh, positively the product. So it should not be reproduced, I think. And uh, maybe it would be a little difficult to introduce all of these little, uh, all of these big changes on the social imaginary uh, all uh, at the same time. If you change in the case of uh, Japanese popular culture, uh, how Date Masamune was or how Oda Nobunaga uh, behaved, it uh, would make the characters literally irrecognizable. People wouldn't know who they are. But if you go introducing these changes little by little, you could affect in the long term the social imaginary to one that is more accurate to the historical reality. And I think popular culture that uh, has that strength, but I think uh, because each of these little changes uh, causes an uproar in the public, producers are afraid to do it. So it is easier to just uh, stick to the old uh, worn out models. In 
case uh, of uh, Japan, this uh, creates the problem not within Japan, but uh, yes, uh, but outside of Japan of Orientalism, because Japan is an exotic place full of samurai, geisha, and seppuku. If you do not put those elements in Japanese video games, people don't identify it as Japanese. So uh, they perpetuate these uh, stereotypes that are from the 19th century. It is uh, totally ludicrous. We are in a globalized society. And the only putting uh, samurai sangais as does not make the game better. So it should not be made. You, uh, it is a um, product of, uh, of popular culture. So it uh, has to be uh, enjoyable. But we should not uh, perpetuate the bad habits just because they are old. It does not make any good to the public and it does not make any good to the product. Of course. Uh, so perpetuating these this historical myths and the sort of social imagination of what a time period was like, of what people were like, or indeed, as you brought up, Claudia, as how mm -hmm. a nation um, how a nation is feels like and what we imagine it to be like that's obviously dangerous and as stefan mm -hmm. touched on this is also problematic because sometimes those historical memories the social memories have been perpetuated for so long and they've been strengthened and reinforced quote unquote for so long that they become the dominant narrative the dominant narrative right now as stefan touched on in his paper is for example that the first world war was a white man's war and of course, uh, in your research, Claudia, you mentioned how we are not quite certain if the characters of the Trusokabe clan even had these nicknames because those are based off of the chronicles that were propagated during the Edo period of the Sengoku period. Yeah. Uh, so linking back to that idea of misconstructed historical narratives influencing the popular social imagination of a time period. In both of your cases, there have been previous misconstructed narratives. So they've existed for a long time. How does that, how did that show itself both in your research on topics and also further on the way audiences receive the popular media work? Um, well, in, in the case of, uh, of 2014 first world war centenary there was actually a, a lot of movement away from these old narratives they wanted to have a multicultural uh depiction of the war they wanted to have those uh representations we've never had before so that's what we got we got a lot of them uh starting uh in starting in in 2014 in in bbc war dramas like the passing bells and and, and the crimson field which, which showed uh uh, soldiers from from the British West Indies through Battlefield One, which was just chock full of of uh, first time representations of of, of uh, soldiers of color uh, in a first world setting. Uh, through 1917, which where Sam Mendes, the director, consciously set out to show a, a multicultural war that this wasn't a white man's war. So, for once, and this is pretty weird. <laughs> the the films and the video games and TV shows they're the ones being up to date. They're actually following modern scholarship. But on the other hand, we got the people who play these games, who view these films, reacting quite badly. Um, Night Seventeen is one case, but Battlefield One is perhaps even the most famous case in which players directly uh, and hatefully responding to the presence of people of color uh, in, in the game. And I have done extensive research in Battlefield 1. Um, I've, I've written a whole book <laughs> about the, the response uh, to Battlefield 1. And what, what these players reacted on at the time was this idea that, well, Sure, there were there were black people in first world war, but there were so few of them. This historical numerical argument that I mentioned about there were so few of them. Should they really be represented? Uh, and for the most part, these people focus on a geographically fixed idea of race. So Europeans, they can only be white. So in any European armies, they 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 should include people of color. And the, the, the notion, 
for example, that there were uh, black men living in Germany in the 1910s for them is just an impossibility. For it. Although we have some amazing scholarship proving that not only did, did uh, men from, from uh, African men live in Germany at the time, but they also volunteered and fought valiantly in the First World War, um, the presence of, of black men in German uniform was ridiculized and just ma made into almost a, a white nationalist meme. Uh, and we can't forget that, that there, there, in, 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 when it comes to representations of race, it's gonna be tied to a lot of, uh, the, the, the hateful reaction is gonna be tied to a lot of modern white nationalism. The, the, the arguments here, the, the conspiracy theories of uh, the great replacement and, and so on, in which, you know, the replacing white people essentially uh, is, is very current in, in these discussions online. However, if, if we take a, a little bit, look back at what people expect, uh, I just mentioned before that during the First World War, it was widely acknowledged that uh, people of color fought in it valiantly, not only from the colonies, but also uh, people who were born in these countries. Uh, but in the aftermath of the war, this was uh, more or less whitewashed. This was most, more, more or less erased from the beginning, uh, at least in Great Britain. In, in France, for example, uh, the, the participation of uh, colonial African soldiers uh, became more or less to show them as sort of a loyalist stereotype. Look at, look at what we do for, uh, this is our great empire. That's what they were used for, but they became a stereotype that was more, more or less soon replaced by a, a more and more focus on, on white French soldiers and, and so on and so on. But I want to uh, bring up Germany again, because I think that's also an even more interesting case. Because in Germany, uh, obviously we know the war didn't go that well for Germany, uh, but during the First World War itself, while they didn't have much success on the Western Front, the African theater war in East Africa uh, brought a lot of attention to uh, to German newspaper readers, uh, where the mythical figure of General Paul von Lette Wolbeck and his, uh, his campaign in, in German East Africa became uh, almost like an adventure novel. And that is something that has not changed. You go to YouTube, you, you go even find any popular history, you're still going to read about the adventurous tales of, of Paul von Lette Wolbeck uh, without, of course, realizing that this was an incredible tragedy for the uh, East African people who suffered uh, under the deprivations of the of uh, Pablo Volbeck's army, uh, which include, of course, wideless uh, forced requis requisitioning of food, leading to starvation uh, throughout German East Africa as a response to um, um, their, the, the campaigns of the German army. And uh, while contemporary German um, commenters uh, who fought in, in Germany, East Africa, did uh, notice this, that well, well we can't call ourselves, ourselves civilized. Look at what we've done to the civilian population here. This was uh, more or less whitewashed in, in metropolitan Germany and later popularized in Great Britain and obviously in America by people who would rather see the uh, East African campaign as an adventure novel rather than a, a, a war that was a tragedy for the civilian black population, civilian African population. And that just goes to show that the traces, just as with Claudia, the narratives were established very early on, if not contemporary to the events themselves and has have lived on until now. And although there are some changes, as I said, from my side, the productions are going to start to change. There is a resistance uh, amongst not only the audience, but also obviously the production companies from changing this because if they started to change it, they would probably start getting reactions like uh, 917 or Battlefield 1. What if, like in the case of Claudia, what if they change those uh, established figures, these characterizations? It, it would be recognizable perhaps to hist historical scholars, but not to the general audience. And what does that actually mean in the long run? In case of Japan, I think the problem is different in case of these narratives are from the Edo period. And the Edo period is interesting because people from that period were uh, near to the Sengoku period, to the end of the Sengoku period. So those people, those feudal lords, were their grandparents, their great grandparents. They were not uh, unknown people, but they were not so near 
uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, assess the historical accuracy of the rumors that they have heard as child, as, as children. And in the Edo period, it was very important in the, uh, the social status. Samurais were uh, very high in the social hier hierarchy, but they were not uh, rich, uh, most of them. So it was important to be very proud of your uh, lineage because you uh, didn't have anything more. Uh, that meant that all of the gunki were written in that epoch because people wanted to feel proud of their ancestors, of their uh, historical past. And it was better if their grandparents or great grandparents were great heroes and not normal soldiers or normal people. And the myths uh, and the origin of the myths lies in there. Uh, the Edo period, uh, even more so, not only uh, had this uh, social uh, particularity, but it is also the period where the popular uh, Japanese media uh, begins, uh, with the, the Kiyoe, the Kabuki, and even the no had historical figures. So all these two elements mixed to uh, make, uh, to not only create these myths, but to expand them in all of Japan and make it a common narrative to all of the islands of Japan that it perpetuates today. Uh, I don't think it would be uh, an uproar in Japanese society if some of these uh, established historical inaccuracies are changed. But the problem are that Japanese people does, uh, don't like change. Uh, it is, uh, they don't like change in politics, in society, in customs, in traditions, and this is a tradition more. So it is not so much uh, that uh, it would be a problem or that it would not sell, that it would be a problem too. But I think the uh, most basic problem is that they don't not, uh, they don't want to change it. Uh, in, Enlacing uh, with, with what Stefan was saying, that uh, people that make movies are uh, white people, so there are uh, groups of people underrepresented, so they don't care about those groups of people. Also, of course, you could, you can be white and uh, be um, and want to represent those people, but it is not the modern, um, the most common point of view. In the case of Japanese video games, they are made by Japanese only. Uh, the producers, the developers, they are some companies like Capcom and that uh, they are more global, but they are an, an exception. They are not the rule. So uh, all of them think the same about uh, history. So I think they don't uh, even occur to them to change it because that is what they have been believing until now all of these uh, of uh, the public believes it so why should they change it because of historical accuracy but they uh, uh, they don't think that video games have an educational um, uh, purpose on or even they don't see the problem in the i i in part i understand them because in the case of stefan for example it is unfair for black people to be underrepresented because they uh, risk their life for their countries and it is unfair that they are forgotten in the case of of the video games i study and the periods i study we have two cases one of them, it is unfair because there are people who have uh, come as beelines just because they are against the popular narrative. And that should uh, be changed because we know there are no beelines in history. There are only people doing things they know they, uh, well, they think is right or they thought that it was the best way or the way to achieve what they wanted. But they are not, uh, they are not good people. There are not bad people, heroes and beelines. And that is a problem. That should be uh, changed or at least matters. But uh, other things like details, like, uh, for example, if that's a, well, if that Masamune was handsome or he was not, if uh, Takeda Singen uh, really had uh, the name of the Tiger of Kai or things like that, I don't think those are uh, dangerous in that sense. And if it, it makes uh, more recognizable the character, I don't... 
I think it is important for historians to say, hey, this is not like this, but I don't think it would uh, be necessary to obsess over it. But I think it should be uh, necessary to change uh, how uh, Japan, how historical characters are perceived if they are uh, only in black and white. I think that is dangerous because uh, if someone is established as a villain, or for example, if black people are established as non-existent in World uh, War II, uh, that is unfair to them. And I think that should be uh, corrected. And if historians say it, uh, let's be real. Historians uh, are only heard by other historians and they are only read by other academics. We don't reach the public unless we do events like this and even like that, it is very difficult. So I think uh, popular media has uh, the strength to reach to a lot of people and to uh, make uh, themselves heard but it should be made step by step probably, not because um, it is the only way that people can accept it, I think. Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, so in our previous discussion about the uh, role of the producers, we touched on a big concept within uh, popular media and historical accuracy, which is intention, right? What does the producer want to create? Do they want to be more true to the history uh, to the historicity of the work or the era that they're trying to depict or do they want to emphasize the appeal and the, and the how fun their final product will be how entertaining their film will be or how engaging their video game will be i think what we've just touched on now also links to another concept which is the reception of that intention right so in the case of stefan with uh, the idea the myth of a white man's war especially during the post-war era, the, the audiences, uh, how the audience perceived this whitewashing and how they accepted it, or indeed in rare cases resisted it, has also impacted then again the popular memory of the First World War to the point where even when video games and the films are moving forward with their depictions of uh, people of non-white uh, descent in the trenches and in the battlefields, people in the general public are viewing this work and going, that's not agreeing with my memory of the First World War, which is itself a distorted memory in the post-war era. Whereas in the case of Claudia, as you mentioned, you have um, the resistance to change of um, Japanese society with popular media and with historical myths, which originated possibly in the Edo period and possibly even before that in the Sogoku period with the pride in one's family and their lineage to the samurai or even the uh, daimyo. But, and then that carries on into the modern day with the sort of conservative nature of um, the media in Japan and how they resist change on such a scale. And as you mentioned, we take small steps so linking back to this idea of reception, how these popular media works are received, what do you think uh, is the role of the audience, both of you, in understanding or even recognizing when their memories, their perceived special uh, popular memories are being challenged and when it's all right for them to um, accept that their idea, their imagination about this time period is flawed and that they have to move on. Because as you mentioned, Claudia, historians are not going to get that much outreach compared to video games, novels and films, even though I bet we all wish they did. So where is the role of the audience in realizing that what they've been accepting for so long and imagining is a false narrative, a whitewashed one or one in which race has been uh, completely dominated by one group, when do they realize that they've been accepting a false narrative and start to change their perception and their understanding of the event or of the time period to be more accurate to the race and the representation of characters? I would like to answer this first, just yes, uh, with an idea, but I get the impression that from a um, public point of view, academics, and research people and popular media people are like on different uh, teams. 
like we are uh, we get along very bad because popular culture only uh, cares about the money and research people don't care about the money and they only care about accuracy so when there is something an uh, inaccurate researchers are very mad and it is like they get along like cats and dogs but that is a stereotype that i think it is not True. Normally, uh, it is true that academia it is a bit uh, uh, traditionally. Uh, it has not uh, has a lot of contact with uh, popular culture, but as we can see, this is changing. So I think if researcher historians, art history historians, uh, could uh, take a step forward and say uh, and not be. Uh, under the media or uh, behind the media, but alongside the media. And they would uh, work together, but not only they work together, but they say so. And uh, producers and companies uh, say it like that, like we are working together. So this is what uh, we are saying. And these people uh, who knows about it is saying this is like that. If we had a common front, I think that would be a first step so that people could relax and could uh, not, uh, maybe there would be people that of course uh, they wouldn't like it because even if you present historical facts to uh, some people, they don't accept it and that uh, we can do anything about that. But I think there would be a lot of people that would uh, be more uh, at ease knowing that they don't have to care about if this is because of uh, being politically correct or because they have not researched enough because they are saying it up front. I think that would be a, a, a good first step so that we uh, we are not at each other's throats, the media people and the academic people, but that we can uh, collaborate. And I think that is uh, something young researchers especially can do. The ones that uh, it be cinema or it be video games, we are all popular media researchers. I don't think it matter. What do you think about it, Stefan? I don't know. I, I am inclined to agree. Um, I think it's obviously important, but I, I also would argue that there might also be mm -hmm. an almost sense of obsession amongst uh, historians of video game studies mm -hmm. and stuff like, to talk specifically about but what is depicted in the game or in, in mm -hmm. the film, as opposed to something that I found a little bit more interesting, what happens on the other way around when mm -hmm. the depiction in the game, historically accurate, but the response to it, what, what, how, what happens when historical memory, this historical memory comes into clash with the other historical mm -hmm. memory and there is a struggle, a contested space mm -hmm. over history. Uh, because that's what it is. I, I, I imagine for the most part, people are receptible for uh, changes in historical depiction and so on. Obviously the people that we talk to, I mean, they, that we've spoken about here, the, the racists, they are a fringe element, but they're very loud. Mm -hmm. They're very loud and that makes them very interesting to study because we love, historians love people in crisis and these people are in like deep, deep uh, mm -hmm. crisis. Uh, but, what we have to, and in, in my case, looking at um, the the reception of of these uh, of these inclusions is that it's so widespread. It's not only limited to uh, to just historical uh, depictions. So now, just uh, 1917 or Battlefield One, uh, people question the presence of, of of African ancestry in depictions ranging from from science fiction worlds through fantasy worlds. I mean, I remember on r slash ask historians answering a question whether or not there were black people in Norway in the 1860s that was inspired by Frozen 2. So you tell it like, you understand me? There is a, a very sense of, of, uh, of ideas here in which well, black people, are they really in the past? Should they be in the past? There's this idea of, of a notion of race being geographically fixed, as I mentioned before. And you know what? I was thinking about something that you said before about the, the Orientalist views. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, what, what, what should a Japanese video game look like? You know, for, you know, should it be a summarizing issues, right? 
I remember in my research uh, in, in, in the reception to Battlefield 1, I came across a comment saying that, uh, some, and I'm paraphrasing here, saying something <laughs> along the lines of, um, uh, when, when, I, when I play a First World War video game, I do not expect to see Black people. When I play a samurai, you know, a Japanese game, I expect to see a samurai. When I play, uh, when I, you know, play a game that takes place in Africa, it should involve African tribes. Uh, and, and that's very much how these people view these things. Mm -hmm. Very predetermined, very uh, light on the surface. Um, but what I found even more disturbing in my own research was the fact that even when they were proven wrong, when people were pointing out, well, hang on, this isn't right. Listen, here's, here's actual historical scholarship. Here are some photographs. Look at these. Um, people, commenters continued to, to <laughs> deny space to these people by using the arguments that I used before, the, the historical uh, numerical arguments. Oh, well, that's one or two. Do they really deserve to be represent, represented? And that's, I think, is the crux of this question. Who deserves to be represented? Because, I mean, we haven't... I haven't yet mentioned uh, the the reaction of black gamers because we do have uh, and and I have recorded the, the reception of of people of African ancestry actually reacting to these games and finding them positive. This is this is the first time they're represented in a in a in a in a video game of this caliber of this and many passionately defended these games online, saying that well if if you know. If if my if my if I am represented, if my kids are represented, if my family, my friends are represented, I don't care if white people are are upset by by a little historical accuracy. But a lot of people were also uh, they, they they also felt like, well, why should my? I remember this one person said, my grandfather fought in the First World War. He was a, an African American soldier. Why did doesn't he deserve to be represented? And I think, well, that's hit, that really hits it because so far we've talked about something that we've called that I call in, in my case when it comes to race mm -hmm. called a, continu a continuity a continuity of whiteness. That's essentially what representations of the past has been. It's just been white, with mm -hmm. with and whatever uh, people of color have been represented in the past have usually been marginalized or been, you know, heavily stereotyped. Uh, Native Americans <laughs> is a great example of that. Um, uh, but that just goes to show you that, again, I think that, uh, well, I, I agree with Claudia's assessment that yes, producers and historians, they should come together. They should definitely work together because they can, they, they can help each other. We can work hand in hand. We can actually create something that's uh, interesting, but you know that doesn't become boring. That still keeps that historic mm -hmm. authenticity light, but doesn't become insulting. That doesn't, you know, become damaging. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but we should also, I, I, I would argue very strongly here, not become too obsessed with just the representation in the video mm -hmm. game, but also look at the other side. What what is the what what are the players bringing into this? What are the viewers bringing into it, this? And how uh, this becomes a contested space of history. I would like in the case of reception to uh, bring another actor, at least in the case of uh, Japanese video games, uh, that, that the reviewers, the professional reviewers of the video games or the critics of the film. Uh, I uh, talk about what I have been researching, but for example, when uh, you see uh, this uh, Japanese video game, as I have said in the presentation, uh, was uh, then um, sold in Europe and in the United States. So I have researched uh, what the critics said about the video game. And in Japanese critics, uh, Japanese reviewers, they uh, talked about the gameplay, about how fun it was, but they didn't care about the historical representation because the Sengoku period is pretty well known in Japan uh, through anime and three series, but because they studied too in school. So it is not so important. It is important that is, they don't care that it is very Japanese because it is a Japanese game and they are Japanese and they know that that is a historical Japanese period. It doesn't matter that it is Japanese or not. It, it doesn't occur to them at least it's totally normal.
But uh, critics said, both in Europe, and I have researchers from uh, Spain, Italy, Germany, United States, France, uh, and the United States, of course, and they, uh, most of them said, uh, look at this, this is, uh, well, not in the Japan, not in the Nobunaga's ambition, but in the Total War Shogun uh, 2, that is a British video game. Look at this, this is so Japanese, so accurate. This ukiyo-e, these uh, silographs, they are so Japanese. They, it is so accurate to the uh, historical uh, reality. And it is false. Uh, Total War Segundos takes the aesthetics of the Edo period because it is the one that, that has come to Europe in the 19th century. Uh, the art of the Sengoku period was Korean and uh, Chinese because Chinese was the uh, great culture of the Sengoku period. It was not Japanese, it was uh, only um, it was there, but it was not of the noblesse. Uh, that was from the Edo period that, it's, uh, that it is the advent of the popular culture, of the Japanese popular culture. So critics are helping to expand those bad stereotypes, orientalism in the case of, of Japanese. They see this is a uh, Japanese of the existing century and it is false. And they are uh, saying it with all the conviction, but they don't know what, about what they are talking about. And then people uh, read these critics, uh, read these reviews and say, as I have said, this is so historical accurate. And I don't know if they thought it uh, before or not, but they uh, like support each other, this ignorance support it, each other. And it, if it is bad in the case of players, I think it is uh, a lot uh, more dangerous in case of critics because their voice is even louder than that of the public. So I think um, even before than the reception of the public, uh, we should make, well, it would be nice if, critics that are in the end journalists, and they are a type of journalist, they would care about what they are saying. And if they say something is historical accurate, they should have asked someone who knows about it. And if not, you should not say anything because you are a game reviewer. You can uh, talk about the gameplay, but maybe you should not talk about how historical accurate this is. And I think uh, that is a very big problem, at least in Japanese uh, video games. I don't know how critics, uh, in your case, uh, movie uh, reviewers reacted uh, about that. They said it was historical accurate or they said it was not necessary to represent so um, little black people. In case of Japanese video games, it is a problem. Mm. Right. So that again, Excellent discussion all around. I think uh, to wrap it up, it's definitely something that is, again, a very big issue, very big topic that we could talk about for hours on end. And I think <laughs> just want to touch on a personal connection here. Um, I have, at least in Stefan's case, I've played uh, Battlefield 1 and, of course, I've watched 1917. And I was very shocked by this very entrenched um, imagine it, imagination that the First World War was, as Stefan puts it, a white man's war. And the myth goes that it was only fought by white men. It very much wasn't. Even a cursory investigation of any front, it reveals that there were people of color and people of indeed various indigenous uh, races and groups present on in the First World War. So it's very interesting for me as a consumer of this media, of this very popular work of media, to realize that for once the media is being accurate. There isn't a problem with the media itself. The problem is, as you two have mentioned, with how the public, how uh, the general uh, audience is perceiving this media. So the, when we talk about historical accuracy, I think it's possibly more uh, fair to say that we're talking about the perceived historical accuracy or indeed the um, historical imagination that the popular uh, that the public has imposed upon the time period or events or a group of people uh, in question on the figure in question especially uh, so we are um, so on that note I think we can definitely say that the main key topics and the key concepts in regards to race and representation within popular media is 
the intention of the producers and what they're attempting to create to strike the balance between fun and historical accuracy. But also on the other side, as you both mentioned, of the of the looking glass, uh, the willingness of the audience to be open minded and accept the fact that perhaps this work is historically accurate, but the lens through which you are judging whether or not it is historically accurate is itself a flawed or uh, fogged up lens due to previous historical misconstructions or misleading whitewashed narratives. I think that's something very much that we ought to all keep in mind. And also tagging on, on again, I would definitely call for more integration between and more cooperation between historians and popular media creators in order to sort of strike the balance and explore that dichotomy or perceived dichotomy between race and accuracy uh, much better. So, yep. Thank you again for that discussion, and thank you especially for the panel. So now that we've reached the end of our panel discussion, I would like to invite each of you as the speakers, and then I will tag on at the end myself, to give some closing remarks about what you've taken away from this session, and also perhaps on uh, what your research has taught you as a whole. Um, Claudia, you may go first. Uh, I think the most important thing I have, we all have gotten from this session, is the importance of being open-minded, both the developers of the video game, the historians or the researchers uh, uh, researching these video games, and the public and the critics uh, playing all of these uh, video games. In case of my research, I was a uh, truly fascinated by how accurate were uh, the video games I were studying. And I would, uh, I thought that it would be awesome if this could be uh, transmitted to the public. How, if they play that, they could learn more and uh, more about uh, history, and that history is funnier than they think. That uh, popular media and history are nearer than all of us think, both the public and researchers and producers. So. I would say that, be open-minded, uh, let's all work together <laughs> for the good of history. Well, it's, it is our past. Uh, it doesn't matter if they are Black people, Japanese people, or it is the past of the world, and that is truly interesting. doesn't matter who you are. So let's have fun and learn more. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Obviously, my wonderful host, Avon. Uh, Claudia. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, as, as always. And uh, of course, thank you to all the, the people behind this great conference. Uh, my closing statement would probably be that have fun, of course, just like Claudia said, obviously there's a lot of interesting things here that, that is being said. I mean, what you're seeing here, this discussion between me and Claudia, this is the state of current scholarship. Um, but I will also bring in a word of caution because Historical accuracy, the notion, the term, can be used as a weapon and is being used, it is weaponized to fight against representations that are in many ways completely correct. Um, and that there are real life consequences in this because there are real life people, people of African ancestry, Japanese people and so on, who are seeing themselves in these media products and are you know happy that they are for, for the first time or for the millionth time but this time in a correct way being represented and representation if i was going to put this end uh, and representation if i was going to put this in a proper way is important and i think that is something that i want anyone who watches this to take away uh, from our discussion. Thank you. So for my end, firstly, a massive thank you uh, to both Claudia and Stefan for being incredible speakers. It was an honor and a pleasure to chair this session. And I think our discussion is definitely something that I'm going to be coming back to and rethinking about in the days to come. But also, again, a massive thank you to the Ask Historians Digital Conference team for organizing such interesting sessions, not just ours, but everything else at this conference this year in this curious time that we now live in. So I think for my closing statement, I'm going to return to the fishing analogy that I brought up 
at the very beginning of this panel and note that now that we've discussed the idea of historical accuracy and representing race within popular media, I think we now have to understand and come to terms with the fact that perhaps we should not be so quick or the general public should not be so quick to criticize uh, those creative producers who do not throw any fish back into the ocean, who take all the fish they can and depict the era of events that they want to depict in their work accurately. And instead, we should look at our own uh, lens through which we view those works and realize that perhaps we are looking through lenses that are not quite as uh, accurate or indeed as clear as we once believed they were. And I think that cooperation, that uh, idea of tearing down and questioning whether or not you are applying a accurate historical lens to judge any form of popular media goes hand in hand with the idea of the producer side of intending to create a work that is fun, but also not disrespectful and not dismissive of the fact that we are first and foremost, a human race, regardless of race, origin, and culture, and that the depiction of our past must include the depiction of everyone's past, not just those of white people. And I think that's the statement I'm going to leave us with. So thank you very much for attending this session. And this is the Ask Historians Racism is So Universal session signing off.